Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the 90th edition of Jack Paul's Up Close webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Wira, journalist for the Jakarta Post, and I'll be your MC for this session. The topic today is the role of big data in forging new norms. But before we start, I would like to explain our agenda. At the beginning, we'll have a 15 minutes of keynote speech by Minister of Research and Technology and also Chairman of National Agency for Research and Innovation, Bapak Bambang Brojonegoro. And after that, we will, we will also listen to some presentations by our three distinguished speakers. And today we will have Sridev Banga, Managing Director of International Data Corporation ASEAN, Heru Sutadi, Executive Director of Indonesia ICT Institute, and Venkat Krishnamurti, VP Product at Omnisai. Each of the speaker will have 15 minutes. And at the end, we will have a Q&A session, so feel free to ask questions about the keynote speech and the presentations by typing them down at the Q&A box at the bottom right of your Zoom screen. So also, please do not hesitate to ask in Indonesian as we will translate it for you. I would like to remind you that if you want the Jakarta Post to contribute to public discourse, please subscribe to www.thejakartapost.com slash packages. I hope you'll enjoy today's webinar, and I will hand over to our moderator today, business desk journalist for the Jakarta Post, Norman Harsono. Norman, the platform is yours. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Wira. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Norman. I am a journalist at the Jakarta Post, and I will be your host for today's discussion. As my colleague Wira mentioned, uh, today we'll be talking about two, two, basically two big themes, which are digital transformation and big data, and how these two themes have played out over the course of the pandemic uh, in Indonesia as well as in Southeast Asia and what to look out for going forward. Uh, we know that the internet and digital technology has been the bloodline for our day-to-day -day activities uh, here in Indonesia ever since many cities entered PSBB earlier this year. We also know that there's been an uptick in the adoption of digital technology ranging from online payments, e-commerce, big data, um, all the way to health tech. And all these technologies, one way or another, rely on big data technology to manage and coordinate information. The government also launched uh, this year an AI roadmap and is also working on its flagship one map policy and also for a one data policy. It's been generally accepted that among the biggest changes we can expect coming out of this pandemic is for people to be more open towards adopting digital technology and by extent, big data. And that brings us to today's expert panel who will try and flesh out this, this issue in greater detail. Already here with us, we have our keynote speaker, Bapak Bambang Brojonegoro, Research and Technology Minister, Mr. Sudev Banga, Managing Director at the International Data Corporation, IDC, ASEAN Division, Bapak Heru Sutadi, Executive Director at the Indonesia ICT Institute, and Mr. Venkat Krishnamurti, VP of Product at Omnisai. So without further ado, let's kick off this webinar with a keynote speech from Minister Bamba, who will outline the government's vision and policies in relation to digitalizing Indonesia. Minister, the platform is yours. Thank you, Mas Norman. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good afternoon, everybody. Uh, distinguished speakers, participants, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for the invitation from Jakarta Post. And I think the topic of big data is very timely. As we know, before the pandemic, we were already in the digital transformation period after the, of course, the Industrial Revolution 4.0. As a result, uh, we should try to do both, uh, as Norman mentioned, about one data program at one side, and of course, artificial intelligence strategy on the other side. And talking about the role of big data, we know that during this pandemic condition, actually these new norms uh, in during the pandemic will be a good preparation for us to accelerate digital transformation, especially after the pandemic. And 
for the time being, I believe it is a good opportunity for us to really enhance the big data transformation in Indonesia. Of course, when we are talking about big data, basically we are talking about digital footprints because the difference between big data and then the so-called statistical data. Statistical data is, of course, a, a result of data collection, data methods that been applied for certain uses, while big data basically is a digital footprint that needs to be analyzed, needs to be uh, modeled in order to come up with the decision support system. So, first of all, we have to believe about why we need the big data. The wider data usage, I think will be useful. Number one is to provide more business opportunities and of course higher revenue and of course we are talking about efficiency here and we are talking about the easiest the easiest way to do the tra business transaction so for example you know by just by doing e-commerce supported by uh, e-payment fintech then we can do the transaction in much shorter period of time as well as a more efficient way secondly of course to reduce the cost itself of course, if you are in the marketing business, previously when you are when you are spending for marketing budget, then some, sometimes you don't know what will be the best target audience. But with the support of big data, digital footprint, then you know better who will be your target. And I think big data supported by artificial intelligence really makes marketing on the different steps in the in different uh, platform because now marketing is better targeted, but at the same time is much cheaper. And of course, for the benefit of everybody in Indonesia, for the society, uh, this big data will accelerate financial inclusion with credit scoring. We are not talking just about payment system. We are talking about how to expand the business through credit distribution. Of course, you can go to the bank to apply for the loan, but you know, all the requirements, collateral, et cetera, et cetera, that sometimes discourage you just to go to the bank. So with the existence of this fintech through the big data, then big data will help the fintech provider to make sure that if there is a peer-to-peer -peer lending, it will be on the safe situation, at least for from the lender's perspective. So the so-called know your customer now can be replaced by this digital footprint. So digital footprint will be very helpful. However, there are some challenges for the application of wider big data. First, of course, the culture, you know, because I believe still majority of our society still do not believe in this thing of called digital online and technology in general. So they, bet, they, they, they feel better to be more conservative by doing business as usual. Secondly, of course, infrastructure. In this case, we are talking about, of course, the internet, the bandwidth, the coverage of the internet in Indonesia. However, we have one, uh, a good uh, statistic to support this infrastructure, the penetration of cell phone. In Indonesia, the penetration of cell phone, which is the number of cell phone connection over population is 100%. So assume it, 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 it might assume that everybody has at least one cell phone. Of course, that's not the case in reality. A, a person can have more than one, but at least the level of penetration showing that we are in the good position to, to do more digital transformation. And last but not least, of course, the talent pool. You know, We have a lot of potential. We can utilize more uh, high tech, but if you are shortage of human resources, sometimes you have to slow down and sometimes you have to depend on the so-called imported uh, experts. And of course, we need to prepare this talent pool for some period of time. You know, It won't take one or two years. It might take five to 10 years, but at least we have to prepare it uh, from now. And then uh, on the next page, uh, the government, uh, is also part of this big data transformation. And a part of this big data transformation, of course, how to make the government 
more uh, electronics, how to promote e-government in many aspects, especially things related to public services, direct public services. And at the same time, we are faced with the existing condition in which, for example, in my experience, every ministry already has its, their own system. Sometimes they just build the system regardless of what others have been developing. So sometimes there is replication, duplication, and the interoperability simply doesn't exist. I remember a simple case when I was still Minister of National Development Planning in which we have to review all the government's program. Then someday we need data from Ministry of Finance because we want to know how much budget allocated for certain programs. And of course, uh, in the era of the digital transformation, we expect they can simply send, you know, uh, a soft copy uh, containing all the data that uh, they did. But in fact, what they send is PDF file. So it means we have to re-entry all the data. And of course, after that, we have to do analysis. So it's just a waste of time. While if there is a trust and there is a system, we can simply, you know, make the data interoperability. So this is a simple thing, and this is what government has to be doing. You know, basically a total reform to make a government uh, more on the electronic side and how to make online public services better for uh, our uh, society. So on the next step, yeah. Of course, before we go to all the ideal things about e-government, we have to work on this one data policy. Maybe any of you, not from government, wondering why we need to talk about this one data policy. What kind of data available so we have to ensure the data is only one? That might be your question. Well, as I mentioned, uh, because of fragmentation and the so-called uh, uh, individualism from its uh, institution in the government, then whenever they you know, collect the data, they analyze the data, or sometimes they make the assumption of the data, that could be different even for one type of data. So that's why there was one, I think, a uh, big issue, if you remember a couple of years ago, in which the data about rice production in Indonesia is not yet determined. Why? Because there are two sources. And these two sources give different data. So how can you say that Indonesia is in the surplus, deficit, or in the good condition? Because there are two data. Let's say one saying surplus and the other saying deficit. If you are decision maker, how can you make decision based on this uh, data that differentiate from one to the other? And of course, to make sure about this, we need to have this one data policy. What kind of one data policy that we are talking about? Of course, we are uh, talking about the benefit about of the public policy. You know, for example, about the rice production and increasing access to the data usage itself, because again. Data should be uh, widely used, especially by respective stakeholders. If you're talking about, for example, the rice data, of course, it's not exclusive only for Ministry of Agriculture, for example. Other ministries need to know why this data showing that we are, let's say, in the surplus or in deficit. So there has to be kind of a second opinion or additional analysis. It doesn't happen if we, you don't have access to the data itself. And then, in, of course, increasing work efficiency, database decision making, which is important, as I mentioned, whether we have to import or not, it, it has to depend on data, not just by you know one side of data, one side of data. And then increasing social innovation, economic growth and investment, which is quite sure. And more importantly, improving the flow of government coordination. If you are complaining about government coordination, sometimes it happens because of this. It happens because the data, as I mentioned, is not interoperability. The data could be different from one to the other. So when it comes to the decision making, of course, decision making will be slower because then you don't have a good data to support your decision. So that's why 
satu data or one data policy has to be issued in order to promote innovation at the end. Why innovation? Because if you have good data, a comprehensive data, then it's easier to come up with any type of innovation, public innovation, uh, service innovation, as well as uh, production innovation. So this is about the big data. And why big data it does matter? Well, big data actually is the source of artificial intelligence. Whenever you want to develop artificial intelligence, the existence of big data has to be there, including the access, of course. And in Indonesia, we just launched national strategy for artificial intelligence. I told my staff at the ministry when I, I think at the beginning of this year, 2020, because I got presentation that some countries, big countries especially, including our neighbors, already have their own national strategy for AI. And then I asked my staff whether we already have, and they said, no, we don't have yet. So right away, I you know, create the task force to come up with this national strategy. And thankfully, it has been launched uh, during uh, National Technological uh, Awakening Day on uh, August 10 this year. And our national strategy for AI will focus on five areas. Five areas that we think should be the priority, you know, to help the economic development and to help, of course, uh, to reduce uh, reducing inequality in Indonesia. Number one, health services. And this is very timely, especially for COVID-19, because the future medicine will depend on artificial intelligence. And if you are talking about telemedicine, that's now becoming a trend, it has to be supported by artificial intelligence. Number two, the one that I just mentioned, bureaucratic reform. If you want more efficient government, if you want government that has better services, this bureaucratic reform supported by, by digital transformation through artificial intelligence will be critical. I think one time president mentioned that sometimes he's tired with all the long bureaucracy and he has the idea, why don't we replace this long and uh, complicated by bureaucracy with AI? Because AI could come up with uh, a simple and faster solution. And then third, education and research. You know, I think it's quite clear. I think whenever we are talking about research, the future research has to involve somehow the artificial intelligence. Number four, food security. Well, Indonesia is a big country. We still need, uh, I mean, staple food, you know, as uh, our basic. And of course, artificial intelligence has to be utilized to secure our food security. Yeah. And it happens already. Whenever we do the monitoring of plantation or monitoring of paddy rice, you don't have to do it manually, but instead you can have devices to do monitoring for you using this artificial intelligence. And they can tell you whether there is a problem with part of your plantation, part of your paddy field, or part of your, you know, uh, fishery, fish, uh, fishery farm, for example. And then number five, since Indonesia is more and more urbanized, currently more than 50%, 53% to 55% of population living in urban area, then mobility and smart cities will be one of our, our priority. And this national strategy has been developed together, not just by government or by special institution, but by many stakeholders, including business community, including universities, including uh, the, the customer. In this case, people uh, in general, society, as well as some uh, organization. Next, if we are talking about our national big data system, of course, uh, there is data created by national companies but also by multinational uh, private companies. And of course, we know that uh, government itself is a big provider of big data. You know? And then uh, you can see uh, 70, almost 75,000 villages and many local government. And of course, 
whenever they produce the data, we need the national big data system that ensure interoperability, ability to do analysis of big data, and as well as the most important thing, sometimes I forget about this, data security. I think whenever we are talking about security today, it's not just physical security that we are concerned, but data security or cyber security now becoming a big and bigger issue. And we need to make sure that we have the ability to do the cyber security uh, program. And then of course, one data program is part of that. Plus, of course, we want to make sure the governance. So hopefully at the end, we can come up with the web portal, multi-platform applications that, you know, utilizing this national big data system, as well as national single window. So we have to leave the complexity that's happening now because again, one ministry system could be different with another uh, ministry system in terms of uh, big data and uh, artificial intelligence. And then our roadmap for government, at least, next page, government big data and analysis. Of course, this year, next, next page, please. Next page, please. Hello? Hello? Next page. Next page. Okay. Uh, in 2020, uh, what we are doing is to prepare a data operation management and then uh, preparing document and content management and planning infrastructure support. So this is the first year. And then uh, next year, we are going to prepare data security management and then establishing data stewardship, which is important, and data integration in ministry and institution. Again, interoperability will be a bigger issue here. And then in the two years, in 2022, uh, we are going to prepare metadata management and data integration from the silo center that now uh, happening in all ministries and institutions. So we are going to integrate the data center. Currently, each ministry tends to have their own data center, but we want to integrate into one data center. And of course, we are planning an operation system. In 2023, we are going to prepare data warehousing, business intelligence management. And in the last uh, year of the five years period, we are going to build data architecture management and as well as monitoring and evaluation. So the government initiative, aside from national data center, hopefully will be completed by 2024, we are going to standardize the big data system, uh, especially created by ministries, as well as we are going to pursue from our ministry research and development of big data technology, and then as well as appliance for easy and reliable storage, several algorithms for automatic data ingestion, and data analytics. Data analytics. So basically, we are moving toward utilization of big data, better or bigger use of artificial intelligence, and more importantly for government, we want the e-government to be at least completed, uh, the foundation of e-government to be completed by 2024. So uh, going forward, we hope that the government will be much more efficient and uh, much more uh, proactive whenever we come up with a big decision uh, to be made. I think that will be my uh, keynote. And again, thank you very much for the invitation from the Jakarta Post. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Great, thank you very much, Pak Bambang. Um, I believe the minister's speech has given us some ground to work on. I'd like to apologize for our listeners and Pak Bambang for that brief technical, technical problem. Um, some key points of the minister's speech, if I may summarize. Uh, number one is that the government is well aware of the, of the urgency to digitalize in the middle of this pandemic. But of course, challenges remain. The minister pointed out the three key challenges, which are uh, culture, limited talent pools, and infrastructure. 
Otherwise, the government is also working to build the regulatory framework to spur digitalization, as well as certain key projects, including the One Data, the single submission system, and the one that took my interest is an interministerial big data system by 2024, with hopes that this will all and eventually improve public services. At least, ladies and gentlemen, the minister cannot stay with us for today's webinar, but uh, Pak Bambang, if you don't mind, we'll take a quick screenshot with you while you're still here with us. So I will count down in three, two, one. And one more in three, two, one. Great. Thank you very much, Minister Bambang. Stay safe and healthy. And now moving on to our first speaker, Mr. Sudev of the International Data Corporation. Mr. Sudev here is an experienced advisor and his team has worked with several big tech names, including Google, Amazon, and Grab. Today, we will talk a bit about the key trends in terms of digitalization and big data adoption on a regional scale in, in a Southeast Asia level and what opportunities and challenges lie ahead. Uh, Mr. Sudev, perhaps we can start by painting the broad picture. How does, how have organizations, according to IDC's research, uh, digitalized and by extent adopted big data across Southeast Asia during this pandemic? Sure. Uh, well, thank you, Norman, and thank you very much to Jakarta Post for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here on this forum and to discuss a topic which I think is um, I would say top of mind for many governments, I would say top of mind for many organizations, especially during this period of uh, the pandemic. Um, if we look across the region in Southeast Asia, uh, when we talk about uh, organizations focus on IT spending, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, for the longest time, hardware has been dominating the spending. Um, 70 to 80% of spending have all, has always been on hardware with, a, with the next uh, segment of spending uh, always been towards IT services, which has been uh, data center services traditionally. Um, in, in March, April, when the pandemic started to hit really hard and, and various uh, Southeast Asian nations started to uh, begin their respective lockdowns, um, all of a sudden, there was a little bit of a panic for a lot of organizations who were, uh, who were sitting on their digital transformation initiatives. Um, and uh, March, April was a very difficult time. A lot of organizations then started to get into the mindset of uh, cost optimization. And from cost optimization, they were running through a curve towards uh, creating resilient infrastructure so that they don't get caught out again. Now, that was a very critical term because in June, July, um, a lot of organizations started to uh, realize that they're not getting out of this anytime soon. And therefore, they had to find a way to continue business, to manage a virtual environment with their uh, employees as well. And therefore, they started to look at their infrastructure and understand what was required for them to have to accelerate digital transformation to support businesses during this time. So we saw, uh, uh, we saw actually quite, a, quite an uptick of uh, Southeast Asian organizations and Asia Pacific was a little bit faster because they recovered a little bit quicker from the pandemic as well. Obviously, China, Korea, Japan, although they hit their respective second waves, uh, but they were a bit faster to recover. But in Southeast Asia, a lot of the focus then started to look towards targeted investments by quarter four of this year. Uh, four technology areas were identified, uh, cloud uh, as a platform, uh, cybersecurity as an area to ensure that there was enough or adequate security around enterprise interaction together with your employees outside of their organizational uh, network. Uh, IoT technologies, uh, there was something of an increase which led towards uh, also an intent on spending on artificial intelligence and uh, big data technology and solutions. In fact, uh, big data uh, analytics, AI, as well as IoT were earmarked with an intent of an up to 20% increase in spending by organizations in Southeast Asia. And a lot of this was with the idea for them to exit into 2021 on a little bit of a, I guess I have to say on a, uh, I don't want to say on a safer uh, platform. However, it, with, with the future in mind, if this were to be prolonged, 
how do I then continue my business? So we saw all sectors across the board starting to explore these technology areas. But the one thing that we, we also noticed uh, across Southeast Asia, as well as the region, was the fact that a lot of them uh, very quickly jumped into these technology areas. Very quickly, they thought that these were the poster child technology areas that I need to invest in in order to save the day tomorrow. Uh, that's the caution we usually give organizations that you do need to think about the outcome. You do need to think around the alignment towards, especially now, the business goal over the next six months and what it's going to carry on into uh, the next 12 to 18 months. So that thought process had to change. And uh, we're seeing that very quickly occur across organizations. And uh, investments are reoccurring around IT. However, they're extremely targeted at this point. Great. <laughs> um, that was interesting. So we just got the big picture of what's happening in Southeast Asia. You can zoom in a bit on Indonesia. How does what's been happening in Indonesia compare to what you just described? Uh, it's a good question. I think uh, Indonesia, um, unfortunately, the uh, pandemic has been slightly uh, prolonged. Um, you know, uh, there are many, uh, Malaysia, for example, is in its third wave, and uh, I think Singapore hit a, a second wave. Uh, Thailand has been fairly stable. However, Philippines and uh, Indonesia, unfortunately, have been in a little bit of what we call a prolonged wave. Um, however, sentiment on the ground at, at this moment, and, and when I tell you sentiment on the ground, uh, the one thing we have done in IDC since January is that we've been taking a pulse off the market every two weeks. Uh, we realized that uh, things change so fast that we, it is extremely important for us to understand uh, the movement of enterprises and the intent for enterprises uh, for 2020. So literally uh, data that I received October 9th, uh, not, not too long ago, that was just a few days ago, uh, we see uh, Indonesian organizations, a, a good bulk of them, 35% of them, trying to accelerate their digital transformation initiatives in Q4 into Q1 of 2021. And a, and a huge area of investment and focus because 74% of them come back and say that AI analytics is the area that they do want to invest in. Once again, though, uh, what is very critical to understand around that is that even from our view of Indonesia, um, for the past couple of years, there has been a little bit of an acceleration in digital transformation. When we look across Southeast Asia, again, Sun Singapore, um, Indonesia, in terms of the spending around digital transformation or the number of projects we have seen, uh, has traditionally been higher than majority of uh, Southeast Asian countries, Sun Singapore. So we, we've seen banks, we've seen manufacturers, and we've seen a lot of uh, uh, overseas investors who have come set up their operations in Indonesia. They have been bringing a lot of their technology across into Indonesia, setting up and spending around uh, elements of AI and analytics. Uh, cloud obviously being a, a very fundamental uh, platform. So with that said though, um, our concern still for Indonesia wraps around the intent to spend and the outcome of the spend. Um, if, if organizations are looking for a, a quick ROI in terms of dollars and cents, that is not going to happen. Um, it's, it's not going to be something traditionally that you, you, you spend now within the next three to six months, you are going to get a return of your investment in terms of dollars. But it's truly the proof of value of each of your digital transformation projects at this point in time. Uh, we see that uh, the convergence or the intersection between the line of business as well as IT started, uh, starting to heighten. In fact, more than 80% of the CIOs and LOBs we have spoken to within same organizations uh, have, have actually had the same business goal. So that's a very different thing for us because it's uh, not often that they do have the same uh, mindset when they do want to spend. So we're a little bit hopeful in that sense for uh, Indonesia that those discussions, I think, have been uh, happening across, uh, across the board. And I think they're, they're starting to get in sync with a lot of their digital transformation projects. If I may go a bit deeper into that, you mentioned about um, how there's a particular interest to invest in AI in Indonesia. Uh, what exactly kind of AI have people been looking into and why AI? Oh, it's a good, very good point again. So AI, I think the, uh, the, the notion around AI has to be very quickly understood by a lot of organizations. Uh, one, one thing we, we realize is that uh, uh, there's a blurring of a line between analytics and AI sometimes, and it's used interchangeably, unfortunately. And uh, when that is used interchangeably, there's a, there's a slight concern in terms, again, of what that, the, the, the wanted outcome 
of that project is going to entail. So if I'm looking at analytics as a form of measure to just uh, look at customer segmentation, we've seen that ongoing in Indonesia for a while now. However, now we're looking at manufacturers, unfortunately, with the, with the pandemic, more areas of automation, financial services, digging a little bit into RPA. Uh, we are starting to see, obviously, within the financial sector, a lot of interest around AI, EKYC. All these different areas have started to come up in a big way uh, in Indonesia. A lot of uh, focus into call centers as well and how they can change. In fact, Indonesia, I was just speaking to a, a couple of uh, individuals uh, within the BPO industry in Indonesia as well as uh, across the board in Southeast Asia. And we are starting to see a lot of uh, BPO type jobs as well moving into Indonesia during this period, because unfortunately in the Philippines, which was very uh, resource driven, human resource driven, um, the automation tools for call centers in Indonesia have actually been a lot better from a technology perspective and a platform, uh, platform perspective. So now we're seeing a lot of that actually enter Indonesia as an opportunity. So we're seeing uh, a lot of interest there. Uh, again, Industry 4.0 is a huge thing for Indonesia as well. And we think that that is a foundational platform that many organizations are going to build upon. Um, there are spots where we talk about agriculture, but you won't see a lot of use cases around there just yet. I think there's still a lot of a mindset change required. But conglomerates in general and the larger organizations in Indonesia have started to then look into very specific AI use cases for the different subsidiaries they have whether it's, uh, again, into manufacturing, whether it's retail, transportation, et cetera. The typical use cases of uh, where you see within transportation, logistics, those are ongoing uh, e-payments, e-wallets. That is something which is ongoing as well. We're seeing a heightened increase of that because, uh, again, removing the idea of having to deal with physical cash and moving towards something which, you know, Indonesia for the longest time, for the past uh, eight, nine years I've lived there, I know the, the cry has been for a cashless society. So I think the, the, the drive and the push, this uh, went better but now to try to drive towards that, that concept of a cashless society. So we're seeing those use cases, e-logistics, and obviously then in healthcare, we're seeing then spots of uh, uh, use cases around uh, AI use within healthcare as well. I think the, the, the one part that I would just slightly reverse to say that we have uh, unfortunately a huge percentage though of uh, Indonesian organizations that have come back. And we are talking about between 77 to, to 85% of organizations we have spoken to who still do not know why they're collecting data. Now, I, I always feel the fundamental discussion uh, around AI, the ultimate of it, whether you're moving or trending towards what I call a nirvana of it, which is uh, predictive analytics, predictive maintenance, machine learning, very deep machine learning, the collection of data at the, as the starting base is very critical. And the reasoning behind why you're collecting that data is going to be critical. As the Park Menteri said, if you want to talk about a one data initiative, you want to talk about uh, the, the collation of data, there are two things to really understand. From a government standpoint, the, you know, discussions can be around open data points, how that can be utilized for number one, whether it's betterment of society, whether it's aiding uh, uh, economies, or whether it's cross, in, uh, cross uh, ministry sharing. From an organization standpoint, it's very critical for them to understand the type of data they are collecting, why they are collecting it, and how they can use it. Unfortunately, a lot of organizations in Indonesia are not displaying that knowledge at this point in time. And I think once we get over that hurdle, that acceleration can occur. Um, I want to, and again, extending that question, there's a lot of um opportunity in terms of adopting, there's demand, there's growing demand for digital technology, including AI, cloud, so you mentioned. So going ahead, what are the opportunities going forward? How big is this market potential for big data and digitalization in Southeast Asia and Indonesia? Okay, so uh, it, again, that question, I guess, is a little bit difficult to answer, Norman. Okay. I'll be frank with you because uh, I, I think it's, again, how you slice the cat. Right, you know, you slice the cat within analytics per se or AI and which use case within AI, you're going to get a, a, a very different number. But I have to say, if you look at just the trend of how uh, governments are spending on AI, 
uh, if you cut to Europe, you look at Estonia, you look at Germany, you look at France. These are investments from the government in the billions, two, three billion US dollars very easily coming out. China, obviously, 100 to 150 billion, uh, billion US dollars coming out in AI focus investment and, and R&D. So we, we have all these, uh, uh, I guess, examples out there in, in, in Europe as well as uh, in Asia Pacific. Korea, for example, has made 2020 a huge focus into AI and 5G. They're starting to pump a good amount of money into that, where between three to five billion US dollars. And we ant anticipate governments across Southeast Asia to also accelerate in terms of that focus and spending. Um, the, 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 one, the, the one element in Southeast Asia I always have to pull out and remind a lot of, uh, especially when we're visitors from uh, more mature countries, uh, the one thing we have to remind everyone is that uh, even for Indonesia, let's be candid about it, there's a lot of movement of um, or the need for budgets and funding to go towards other projects, whether it's hard infrastructure, we still require that, whether it's to building hospitals, building schools, these are very fundamental projects that still have to occur. And therefore, if there is a lack of a positioning of a huge budget into specific AI, I do believe the government can be slightly excused around that. But ultimately, that potential is going to grow. We, we see this from, you know, for the way Indonesia is trending towards 2023, 2024, we anticipate more than half of the GDP to be digitalized. And when we say more than half of the GDP uh, being digitalized is going to be the output of products and services on a digital manner. And whether that comes from an ideal of or a platform such as AI, machine learning, we, we anticipate that's going to be quite huge for Indonesia. Right. Um, and, and I like that you touched about the issue about the need to invest in hardware, because I believe that ties to what the minister mentioned about limitations and in infrastructure. So in that sense, uh, you know, what have been the key challenges or, or limitations faced by organizations trying to digitalize or adopt big data in Indonesia? Yeah. How does that compare to what's happening in Southeast Asia? Well, good news, bad news. <laughs> Uh, good, good news is that we've seen, uh, uh, because there's a, there's a little bit of a, occasionally a bit of a lag from uh, um, Southeast Asian countries uh, in adopting certain technologies uh, compared to their Asia Pacific or, or global counterparts. The good news is that we've seen them learn a lot. Uh, before they, they embark on something. So they've been able to learn from very specific case studies, very specific pitfalls that could entail uh, project failure, for example. In fact, just uh, last year, I was in Jakarta presenting a statistic that uh, literally 55% of um, uh, digital transformation projects in Indonesia uh, fail, literally one in two. Uh, and that stat did not get better, unfortunately. And then when we dug deeper, we went into AI-based projects. We found uh, uh, analytics AI-based projects. We found 70% of that fail within Indonesian uh, organizations. And the first pitfall we realized was because there was a huge focus and, and attention and budgets uh, uh, trailed off, I mean, very much into the technology area specifically, that there were elements within the organization that they didn't uh, really pay attention to. So whether it's a, a creation of something as simple as a, a digital team to drive this, whether we have buy-in from different business units to support the initiative, and of course, what that tangible outcome is going to be, what that ultimate proof of value is going to be. That's what caused 70% of those AI projects to fail. And it was just something very nice that they love to dive into and there was money spent. Um, I, I uh, you know, a little joke I have in Indonesia though with uh, some of my friends over there is that uh, you fail fast and then you, you, you spend again. And that might be good because if you compare to your Southeast Asia counterparts, if they fail, they're not going to come back and invest for another year or two because they're going to be very worried about wanting to spend again. The good news about Indonesian enterprises we've seen is that when they fail in a project, they pick themselves up really quickly and say, we need to reinvest, reinvest in this and we need to understand how better we can do it. The, the other pitfall, and I think the Park Menteri also, uh, Park Bambang also mentioned this, was the fact that talent was a scarcity. So when we talk about talent, and, and talent being a scarcity, I'll be honest, Norman, is across every country. 
it's 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 not it's not uh, it's not unique to a given country. It is it is across every country. I was just having a very good discussion with somebody out of Silicon Valley who said that you know talent is a scarcity in Silicon Valley, and you sit there being wow, you can't believe that. So talent is an issue, and when you embark on these things, which are a little bit more ahead of the curve, it's very important for organizations to also consider that idea of talent. And a lot of our advocacy now is that don't necessarily try to build your talent from uh, scratch, okay. but bring into a partner ecosystem, a very trusted partner ecosystem of which you can borrow talent out. And I think that's going to be very critical for Indonesian enterprise in the future. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Sudev. Very data-rich, comprehensive um, discussion just now. Uh, some key points, if I may um, summarize, is that the turning point would have been June, July, uh, starting with March, April, June, July. That's when Southeast Asia and Indonesia began to really become aware of the need to digitalize. Um, if we talk about regionally, we've seen heavy focus investments on three particular technologies, which are cloud, uh, IoT, and AI. In Indonesia's case, there's a particular emphasis on AI. In terms of the pitfalls, uh, it's, it's on one hand quite bad news in the sense that 50% of companies failed to conduct digitalization, 70% when it comes to specifically adopting AI. But the good news for Indonesia is that at least they have that sort of resilience they can pick themselves up and keep trying again. Thank you very much. All right. And um, by the way, audience members, if you think you've missed something from any of our speakers, don't worry, you can rewatch this webinar on our YouTube channel, Jakarta Post. The link is available at the top left of the screen. Um, our next speaker is Bapak Heru Sutadi. He previously served as commissioner with the Indonesian Telecommunications Regulation Body, BRTI, which is a body under the Communications and Information Ministry. He is now executive director at the Indonesia ICT Institute, which is uh, an IT think tank based in Depok. Bapak Heru is uh, frequently cited by the media as a source when it comes to IT related matters. Uh, but Heru, I'll start with perhaps a similar question. What have been the key efforts by the private sector to digitalize and to adopt big data in Indonesia specifically during the pandemic? Uh, thank you, Pak Norman. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, distinguished participant, uh, valuable speakers and panelists. Uh, I'm very honored to be here uh, to share about the big data situation in, in Indonesia. Uh, regarding your question, Pak Norman, I think big data is the new phenomenon, which is uh, strongly connected to a number of technical, social, and legal development. Big data comes to Indonesia around 2013. At that time, we did a survey and research about how important big data to the corporate or the government. And the result is uh, maybe we know that uh, usually uh, we are familiar with the fee of uh, big data. The first is volume. I think it's many people, you know, that uh, data growing very fast, including velocity and variety maybe not only uh, structured data, but on also uh, unstructured data and uh, veracity. But based on my uh, research in Indonesia, we can uh, put another fee for the uh, big data is a uh, victory. So uh, if uh, we can manage or we can use uh, big data for uh, in our company, in the government, so we can be a uh, victory uh, to make a decision, to make a uh, uh, maybe a, a wisdom or something in, in a policy, uh, etc. I think. And in Indonesia, actually, uh, before uh, you know that uh, big data is not uh, separate with the other uh, term, uh, as uh, Pak Bambang mentioned before, that uh, big data intervene with the several other terms. It's like open data, data reuse. Internet of Things, Smart Data, Profiling, Algorithm, Cloud Computing, and Mr. Uh, Sudev said uh, there is a correlation also big data with uh, artificial intelligence because uh, we have to analyze the data. The data is nothing uh, uh, without uh, uh, we can analyze the data. 
or ma many things, I think. So we need a holistic approach to uh, uh, to know about big data and related phenomena, I think. And uh, as you know that uh, before COVID-19, we already uh, we have the uh, national strategy how to adopt the industrial revolution 4.0. So many people, many corporation here, many uh, government institution, we talk about the industrial revolution. So we try to adopt, uh, including big data, big data, artificial intelligence, blockchain, and many uh, robotic or many thing, I think. And uh, as you know that uh, COVID-19 has changed uh, the game and habit. So some people said that uh, COVID-19 is the best chief transformation official. So uh, right now we have to work from home, school from home, praying for, from home, and maybe uh, we cannot forget that uh, we are shopping from home right now. So government uh, already uh, uh, have strategy that uh, we have to move to digital transformation. Uh, they already try to put this some budget, allocate, allocate some budget, maybe two billion uh, US dollar or uh, 30 million for uh, two or uh, three years. But uh, before COVID-19, actually, uh, some uh, company in Indonesia for private sector especially, they already uh, try to implement and adopt uh, big data for their activity. It's like uh, telecommunication. So maybe uh, Indonesia, you know that we have uh, 330 uh, million users for the telecommunication. So how to manage the user if uh, we cannot if we don't use a big data. So uh, in the meantime, uh, operator, they use a big data. So they know that uh, when maybe the Indonesian uh, citizen, Indonesian people, they top up the, 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 their post or their money to the uh, cell phone, uh, when and uh, how big. Usually because uh, you know that uh, in Indonesia, mostly we are a prepaid uh, user. So maybe we top up maybe 50,000, uh, 100,000, something like that. So uh, operator, they must use the, the big data. We said that, uh, you know, that uh, already mentioned oleh uh, Pak Bambang also that uh, now financial sector, banking sector, they try to adopt big data also, not only for credit scoring, I think, but uh, for many things for the uh, uh, banking activity. And uh, the other is uh, also, uh, not private sector, but also government. So they know even it's like uh, right now, many uh, protests regarding maybe uh, Cipta Kerja X. So uh, actually government, they have a calculation when the uh, protester uh, will be finished. Uh, that's uh, already used uh, since 2013, I think, when uh, government at that time increased the uh, oil. So we know that uh, they try to uh, analyze uh, what uh, many people say in the Twitter, especially. So they know after three or four days, everything uh, back to normal. And in Indonesia also, uh, uh, we are very, now many people talking about politics, a politic activity also already use uh, big data. So you know about the many things about the, who the candidate for the presidency in, since 2014, 2014, 2019, which one that uh, favorable with the uh, citizen. The others is uh, transportation, I think. Transportation sector Indonesia now uh, very aggressive, even maybe right now uh, two players only, before many, many players uh, with small player. Uh, and uh, besides the transportation, they also uh, offering the uh, food uh, for the delivery, something like that. So they have to know about the, uh, with the uh, visual, uh, data visualization with the geospatial. So I think they know which uh, Indonesian citizens like in Jakarta, Indonesian user for the transportation online, use the, uh, the, the bicycle or use the car from where to where. Uh, before I read that uh, many people try to use the uh, 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 car transportation uh, using uh, 
uh, platform uh, application uh, from the favorable place in Jakarta is uh, Kokas, Kota Kasablanka. Uh, we know that from the uh, uh, big data uh, analysis, I think. And the other is uh, some uh, company, especially for the digital platform for e-commerce. They also already use the uh, uh, big data, so they know well, if we use for the first time which uh, product that usually we try to uh, searching, maybe a cloth, shoes or something. So maybe uh, what kind of uh, product uh, and we ability how much uh, we pay, maybe 100,000, 200,000, something like that. So I think uh, big data is the, not new for us, but uh, maybe uh, some uh, obstacles still uh, uh, around this uh, business. Yeah, as uh, Pak Bambang said, maybe the government just uh, wants, uh, just they already uh, initiative, but uh, big data system maybe uh, uh, finished in 2024 or 2020, but uh, at least they already uh, have a national big data system. I think that's all, uh, Pak Norman. Great. Um, you mentioned about the, the government's the public sector's efforts to try and digitalize and use big data. I want to go into a bit more detail about, I think, the government's two, two, two flagship big data projects, which are the one map policy and the one data policy. Let's hear what are your thoughts on these uh, projects, Pak Heru? What do we have to look out for to make sure that these run as planned, basically? Yeah, one data is only the part of the how we can use uh, big data. Big data, we can use many things. Uh, yeah. I think the problem in Indonesia, the first is uh, we still have problem with one data. You know that uh, it's like how many uh, population in Indonesia. I think maybe uh, my data is different with uh, your data. It's different between the ministry. So sometimes if... Uh, I try to find the data about the data population, so it's different. 250, 270, or 262 is different. I think that's the, the best one that uh, uh, government must uh, provide to, to, to our citizen, not only for Indonesian citizen, actually, because many investors want to know about the real data about uh, Indonesian uh, also. But the others, I think we can use uh, big data for uh, many things. As uh, I said before, it's like uh, uh, some uh, international institutions like uh, UNDP, they try to make some effort how we can uh, use uh, big data and AI, artificial intelligence, uh, for goods. You know, so uh, it's like uh, in the pandemic, I think we can use the big data. It's like uh, in China, they, they use uh, big data, especially with the artificial intelligence, how to detect uh, somebody that's uh, with a COVID disease or not. And in Indonesia, still not uh, uh, maximal uh, at the time, I think. But uh, I know that uh, uh, we need uh, digital uh, transformation for uh, this thing. Yeah, we, we still have a problem with the the first is uh, maybe infrastructure, internet speed, and the others. Uh, maybe we, we have to know about the uh, what kind of uh, uh, what kind of uh, we, we can use uh, big data for uh, our life. Uh, it's like uh, maybe I, I have read uh, UNDP research that uh, we can know about uh, the price of beef maybe. Uh, which uh, which uh, province that uh, maybe the beef price is uh, higher or maybe uh, increase under that. So I think uh, we can use uh, for uh, many things, big, big data for the pandemic, uh, especially. Uh, also, we know that uh, maybe how many people uh, say about the pandemic uh, COVID-19 in Aceh, maybe in uh, West Java, or maybe how about uh, people in uh, Papua talking about uh, pandemic, something like that. Very interesting. Um, I just want to connect to something Mr. Sudev mentioned before this, and that is yeah. that many businesses were trying to invest more 
in cybersecurity. And we know that in general, you know, with, with more people using more digital technology, then we're more exposed to the risk of cybersecurity. Yeah. Uh, but Hero, maybe what, what are your thoughts on this? Can we say that Indonesia as an overall has become more aware about cybersecurity with this pandemic? Yes, uh, I think big data is not talk only about the technology, but also about the budget, about the what it wants to achieve, its management, and the other challenge is about the privacy, security, ethic, and uh, right now we're still talking about we need the specific or new regulation or not for uh, big data. We can compare with uh, another country. But uh, I think in Indonesia now we are, uh, uh, our president on the, already uh, sent the draft to the parliament about the uh, private dat data act. So uh, maybe in the short time, maybe um, I don't know, maybe in this year or maybe in the next year, so we can have the uh, data uh, protection uh, act, I think. Uh, this act uh, follow the general data protection regulation based on the, in Europe and uh, uh, England, I think. So I think, so in the next time, big data is uh, more clear about the privacy, about the security, yeah, sometimes even uh, even we wrote something in the Facebook, Twitter. Sometimes we are not uh, uh, we are not uh, clear that data is a private or a public data. So maybe if uh, we have the X, so we will clear. So maybe the uh, big data can uh, separate which one the that uh, public data, which one the, is the private data, data. So we can use the uh, big data more uh, uh, better and uh, optimal in the next future, I think. Okay. And uh, my last question is, if you could just summarize what you said just now, what advice do you have for public and private institutions in Indonesia that are trying to digitalize themselves or adopt big data? Yeah, I, I think uh, some com a company, corporate, uh, some uh, uh, private company, government, they already adopt the uh, big data. But uh, my uh, uh, recommendation how to uh, success uh, when we use uh, the big data, the first is uh, about the leadership here. Yeah. Leadership is not, if we talk about the country, so leadership must be from the uh, president, from the ministry, something like that. So I think fortunately our president already mentioned about the Indonesian digital transformation, already uh, provide uh, some budget for two, three years. But after that, uh, he must uh, announce a division about the next Indonesian digital uh, transformation. The second is, uh, if we talk digital transformation, uh, like or unlikely, so we have to uh, talk about uh, new uh, technology innovation and adoption. Great. Last year, uh, we talked about the industrial revolution, so maybe uh, not only uh, we talk about artificial intelligence, also big data, blockchain, maybe in the short time, we have to talk about the 5G technologies because you know that uh, infrastructure in Indonesia uh, still a problem. Uh, you know that uh, yeah. 12,500 uh, 12, villages still cannot uh, connect to the uh, internet. The other is uh, we have to transform the culture and organization. So uh, I'm happy that uh, Pak Babang said that the data-driven decision in Indonesia, because uh, uh, this is uh, very important. Because uh, right now many things talking about the hoax, about uh, uh, that disinformation, this communication. So maybe if we can implement, if we can adopt uh, big data, so we can talk about the. Uh, we can use uh, data the driven uh, decision. So everything based on uh, data, not hoax, Understood. not uh, yeah, based on uh, feeling or something like that. Great, great. Um, 
Terima kasih sekali. Thank you very much, Bapak Heru. That was a very insightful presentation. Thank you, Bapak Heru. I may again summarize some of the key takeaways I got from listening to you. Um, Bapak Heru listed some key industries that are engaging in digital transformation, including finance, telecommunications, transportation, and the government. Um, he noted that government actually already use big data in, for example, predicting how long riots would be. I think it's a very interesting case study of how public institutions can use big data. Uh, you also mentioned, I think, two key government programs that will be uh, key to making or breaking Indonesia's digital transformation at, at this moment, which are the one data policy, which will sort of standardize and sort out publicly available data. And second is the private data uh, regulation. I think it's in the form of a press, and this will sort of set the standard for how we deal with cybersecurity as it becomes a greater risk as Indonesia tries or Indonesia enters more digitalization. Okay. So once again, thank you very much, Papa Heru. Thank you. And man. this brings us to our last speaker who will provide a more case specific perspective into the whole big data discourse. Uh, Mr. Venkat, thank you so much for being with us. Mr. Venkat is VP of product at OmniSci. Um, OmniSci is a California based tech company that sells big data analytics and visualization software. Uh, I just checked it recently. In 2018, OmniSci secured their Series C funding worth $55 million. Uh, that, is that correct, Mr. Venkat? That's correct, yes. That would make it a, a matured a player within the big data uh, industry. Mr. Venkat will be delivering a presentation uh, about, about the issue. Mr. Venkat, you have 50 minutes. The platform is yours. Thank you, Norman. So uh, thank you for, uh, it's an honor to be on uh, this webinar today. And thanks to the Honorable Minister and the other speakers. Uh, I'm very glad to be able to share uh, you know, our perspective here at Omnisai on, um, on the questions that were discussed as well as uh, more than just talking about Omnisai as a company, uh, what we wanted to do or what I wanted to do was to uh, to draw maybe a delineation of the kind of data era that we live in today and some of the challenges that it poses, both to uh, you know, the processes in institutions as well as the nature of tools that they use, as well as, uh, you know, in, in, and out of that, the kind of needs that emerge and the solutions that a company like Omnisci is poised to provide. Uh, so uh, I'm the VP of product here at Omnisci, which means I'm basically responsible for the direction that the company takes in terms of what we build on the platform to address our mission and our vision. And to, to, to talk about that briefly, our mission as a company from our inception is to make uh, what we say is analytics, instant, powerful, and effortless. And the last word is important here, which is everyone. And when you talk about analytics, you know, people tend to, uh, as today was talking about, uh, you know, there is always the question of whether we're talking about analytics, we live in an age of AI. We tend to think of it as we're referring to broadly the ability to get insight from data. It doesn't matter the scale or the nature of the data that you're dealing with, but really the ability to ask questions of data and get insight. That insight could be simple. It could be using methods that are simple. It could be complex using more modern or prevalent techniques like artificial intelligence. But in the end, these are all, you know, on a continuum of ways of asking questions of data and getting insight from it. And really for us, the goal has always been to make that process instant, which means from the time you ask a question to get uh, an insight, how quick can that be? Because after all, we know that time is probably the most precious commodity that we all have. Powerful, which means the nature of insight itself uh, can be informed by different perspectives. And then effortless and everyone are important as well, because the idea here is more often than not, the ability to look at data, get insight, is actually a pretty powerful, uh, I, one could almost say it's a pretty powerful right for most uh, citizens in 
in uh, as part of a society right these days i mean just like you have the fundamental skills of being able to uh, read and understand and write and so forth these days we live in a world where you perceive your world you, first of all you're generating data which leaves as the minister honorable minister was pointing out traces in the world and then being able to interpret those traces to make more informed decisions whether you're a business or whether you're even an individual uh, is critically important and that skill be what what omnisize mission is is to not just have that be concentrated in a certain set of people or with a certain set of uh, institutions but to make that as widely available as possible right so you know we talked about i think uh, people talked about the skills gap i think so they've mentioned it the honorable minister mentioned it uh, uh, and you know we we uh, our intent is to address the skills gap in, in a way by making this process democratic and having everyone uh, having as as many people draw insight from data as they can uh, norman you you talked about uh, you know uh, the funding that we've raised recently uh, we are a relatively mature uh, startup we've gone through three rounds of funding including from some fairly well known names in the uh, venture, venture capital industry here in, in silicon valley we are headquartered in san francisco and uh, we've been uh, as a company we've been around for the last 6 uh, years now before i get into what omnisci specifically is i thought i would spend a little bit more time talking a little bit uh, talking about the nature of data that we are all uh, dealing with today and how it is a bit of a shift from the nature of data that we were used to dealing with earlier so the first point here is uh, around connectivity right so when you look at the world today this starting with the emergence of mobility and mobile connectivity you know almost two decades ago at this point but then moving on to industrial co connectivity and then things like connected vehicles data is being generated by things that are on the move and data is being generated essentially all around us right so this is a well known fact and uh, one of the key characteristics of the data that uh, is that we are capturing today is that it is not just happening at a point in time it is also very clearly located right so i think uh, 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 paheru referred to the uh, geospatial aspect of data this is a critical one basically because you now have this context of location as well as time in the data that you're dealing with in other words questions that you want to ask of your data are not just about when but also about where and that in turn it provides both a set of use cases as well as opportunities so when you look at the operations of uh, an enterprise more than uh, before it is critically important to consider the impact of where you are planning uh, to investment right so where are you planning to put up a store where are you planning to as a telco where you where are you planning to put up uh, infrastructure to support a base of users who might have certain characteristics these are all questions where uh, you know planning uh, the life cycle of the enterprise you might want to consider location as a key part of how you make those decisions and more importantly uh, as this starts to happen uh, one of the advantage one of the opportunities it presents is uh, you naturally have data silos emerging as i think people have referred to earlier and breaking these down for operational insight is both an opportunity and a challenge uh you now when you shift from the operations of the enterprise to the customer experience you know if you're talking about commercial companies and organizations or even even governments who are serving uh, essentially their citizens you look at uh you know how customers are experiencing the world the data traces that they generate and how those uh, generate what we call at omnisci uh, patterns of life so these could be you know how do you move from point to point through a given day what are the patterns that emerge both in space and time about you as a person or you know it could be vehicles it could be uh, patterns of movement of uh, entities and so forth and all of these are both both uh, both they pose opportunities as well as risks because when you look at this kind of data the natural question that again was something that we touched upon earlier was around security right this kind of data is valuable but it also raises some very clear questions about how is it collected who owns it 
and what is the nature of insight that you can get from it while being able to generate insight and exploit it you also want to be careful about privacy and security right? so this is critical so it, this again it, it's a way it's a way to say it is it's double edged sword in some cases and the last but not the least there is the opportunity to to essentially create and monetize a set of data products emerging from this a confluence of uh, data that contains both location and time uh, it it's a, it poses i think in some ways a sort of interesting set of challenges at a technical uh, at a societal and certainly uh, at an organizational level in terms of uh, both being able to take advantage of it but also know where the boundaries are and respect them so uh, that's you know in some cases uh, you know this is the nature of data that we're dealing with today and to dive a little further into that you know the characteristics of data that we're dealing with here are one is you know uh, as we were talking about earlier volume velocity and variety so everything is moving it's uh, the data that's coming to us is at high frequency the universe of data sources is exploding the other thing that i'd like to always point out uh, when we have these discussions is while everyone is aware of the, the scale and the volume of data that's being generated uh, one interesting question that's worth asking is you might have 10 times the volume of data that you had maybe even a year ago you might have even 10 times the amount of money that you can spend on it and 10 times the number of questions that you want to ask you unfortunately do not have 10 times the amount of time to answer those questions so time to insight is critical and uh, the ability to ask and answer and see trends within seconds and minutes is now important because after all that is the most inelastic quantity in this equation right you don't have more time while you have more data you have more questions and you have uh, in the need for more insight uh and then we talked about the distinction between analytics and artificial intelligence earlier i would like to bring that back to this question of you know when you're asking questions of data you want to see patterns both in location and time and there is this question of understanding what happened before while looking ahead what at what could happen and how to be able to act on it right so this need for both diagnostic and predictive insight is just part of the overall continuum of needs that you have of data and the last but not the least is this, this idea of context so uh, you know every time you look at data in isolation there is always the sort of hanging question of what if you could get more data to add more context to it a typical example is you know when you're looking we actually did a fair bit of work with the us government around the covid-19 pandemic and how we could get uh, location based insights around the pandemic and what we also considered is the example of things uh, of data sources like weather and demographics and events for example what we found is that in the us uh, when we started to look at movement restrictions right uh, in rural areas where there's a lot more uh, you know uh, gaps or distance between people versus in urban areas the there is a certain uh, response to movement restrictions that were uh, that's different from in the urban areas now being able to consider demographics helped us understand that this is one of the reasons why it's happening and when you also consider weather and how it plays into it uh, these are additional contextual data sources that you can always bring into a particular analysis and it's not just true of the covid-19 pandemic you could do the same thing for any type of uh, insight or analysis that you do within your enterprise and to be able to incorporate these kinds of contextual data sources is both a challenge and an opportunity because most uh, uh, enterprise data infrastructures are not equipped to do this so really this brings me to my next point around the need for tools and processes today that need to adapt to the world of data that we live in uh, you know uh, that i just talked about so one of the issues that we commonly see is the inability to operate at the speed of human thought and in fact we use the term the speed of human curiosity because as you see an insight the next the natural thing that happens is you want to ask the next question and get the next answer and invariably the uh, tools and processes today are not designed around that the honorable minister referred to the uh, an example where you had pdf files that were being essentially uh, presented around insight and we don't live in that world now where data is coming at you at uh, you know thousands of events per second uh, and you want to ask questions of it at about roughly you know uh, at least a question a second maybe you know this is kind of the uh, challenge an operational challenge that's very real and we need to tackle 
And then the next part of it is while uh, you have this need for timely insight, the path to insight is getting longer and complex, just in data acquisition, uh, harmonization, putting it together and being able to ask questions. And while you know, uh, invariably there are processes established for this, these tend to be fairly rigid and structured to the point where it doesn't allow for uh, exploration and being able to ask uh, you know, uh, more uh, interesting questions. And this of course plays into the, the organizational problem, which even a tool like ours, as much as we like to say, pretend is not going to really address around siloed people, uh, data and technology, which is something that everybody acknowledged. It is a question of how you, uh, while bringing the right tools and, and uh, into place, how do you address the organizational, organizational challenges around silos of people and uh, data and technology? Uh, and technology can only do so much. And, and the last but not, not the least is, is the nature of data itself, right? So we, uh, when you're faced with additional uh, potential insight in your data and additional opportunities, if your tools are not adapted or your processes are not adapted for it, then you're just leaving behind that uh, that you know uh, set of opportunities on the table. So we tie, uh, at Omnisa we talk about this idea of a converged uh, platform, you know, for for uh, data and insight. And the the characteristics of a platform like this are primarily around uh, answers at the speed of curiosity. So leaving aside the technical underpinnings of what we do, it really comes down to how can you get answers from data as quickly as possible using uh, as sophisticated methods as you might want to use in a particular situation. And, and secondly, bringing in uh, the aspect of where in addition to when, when you look at uh, uh, data and you wanna ask questions of it. And last but not the least, the continuum of techniques that go from you know, simple sophisticated diagnostic analytics to artificial intelligence and the methods that have recently emerged. So the idea here is everybody wants at some point to do all of these things, but it is critically important to bring these together in a platform that makes it accessible to the widest uh, audience as possible. And at Omnisci, that's always been our goal as a platform and as a, as a technology uh, company to, to do that. So uh, really that uh, one of the topical examples that uh, I, I just wanted to point out, which uh, uh, we did recently, like I mentioned is around uh, how this can be applied and how these uh, tools and approaches can be applied to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we covered uh, everything from how do you analyze movement restrictions to how is it possible to do large scale contact tracing uh, you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in a fluid and interactive manner that will help uh, inform policy responses. And last but not the least, you know, prepare for a forward looking posture with respect to things like uh, medical institutions and uh, you know, uh, healthcare organizations, as well as uh, uh, governmental organizations that support these initiatives, right? So if you look at these multifaceted problems, even in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, they're all like a microcosm of the kind of data challenges that we face today and the opportunities. So uh, I'll end with that and I'm happy to answer any questions. Now. Great, thank you very much, Mr. Venkat. Very, again, a more case-specific perspective into the big data issue. Once again, if I may summarize some of the key takeaways from Mr. Venkat's presentation, is that as time goes on, the amount and speed at which we're receiving data is just growing exponentially. And there's a particular emphasis on location and time aspect of that data. And in that sense, uh, big data tools Play, play an important role in how, in how organizations, like whether private or public, can navigate through these uh, changing times. And that's where OmniSci comes in. Great, so we still have uh, slightly more than 30 minutes left for discussion. And with that, I'd like to open the question and answer session. I believe my colleague Vera has selected some questions for our speakers, and she will be moderating this Q&A session. Hello, Vera. Vera, the platform is yours. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Norman, and all the speakers for the presentations. Now let's move to Q&A session, and we already have so many questions here, but I would apologize in advance because we wouldn't be able to answer all of them due to limited time. So the first question is, 
Actually, it's about the cannot speak, keynote speech, but the minister asked the minister Bang Bang already left the platform. I will pass it to the all speakers. So this is for um, okay, opportunities in collecting and understanding digital footprints of demographic data, especially given the privacy and security involved. And also we'll be will we be engaging private companies in building our e-government. Yeah. I'm I sorry, Vera. Maybe it was just me, but could you repeat the question? The connection oh. went a bit uh, bad just now. You're still muted, Vera. Oh yeah. Okay. The first question is actually about the keynote speech. However, uh, as, the, as the minister Bambang already left the platform, I will pass it to all the speakers, and we'll start with uh, Mr. Sudev. So what are the challenges or opportunities in collecting and understanding digital footprints of demographic data, especially given the privacy and security involved? And the second one is, will we be engaging private companies in building up our e-government? Okay, thanks, Weira. I, I apologize, I did not answer because I really couldn't hear you just now. So I, I, I didn't mean not, not to answer. Um, I, I think uh, very quickly, those two questions. The first one is uh, the advantage of this, and we see this in a lot of countries and uh, even, even in Malaysia and Singapore, the, the huge advantage over having a central repository of data is the fact that uh, around national security, around uh, cases of a pandemic, uh, that's when, that's when uh, uh, collated data such as this or, or so-called re repository becomes very important or collection of it. But I go back to my earlier comment around the, the, the idea of open data and closed data. I, I did see a question around that. And I think that's a very important distinction to actually make. Open data is meant to be you know, available, made available uh, out to economic sector citizens as well as the uh, government. And it, it's fairly anonymized to the point that you, it's not identifiable. And that data is then put to very good use in terms of uh, usually is for the so-called betterment of society. And we have split that down as well to say that uh, citizens have a willingness to share their personal data for two uh, instances, the, the betterment of society being one of it. And of course, then in the case of a national emergency, they are very willing to share data. We, we, we've seen that uh, occur quite a bit. Uh, on, the, on the flip side, and then when we talk about personal data protection uh, and, and privacy around data, I think that's where it's very critical for Indonesia to develop very clear policies around personal data protection. And I think that is the point of where a lot of citizen concerns tend to be. And then when you blend it out, and this is where I will uh, combine it with your, your, your second uh, question, uh, I think working or collaborating together with private organizations, especially in understanding the use, the purpose, Purpose around data, especially in terms of how they will process the data and utilize the data, uh, policies around that, guidelines around that is going to be extremely critical. And I think this is where input from industry associations related is going to be very critical because, again, there is diverging or difference in terms of the maturity when it comes to data utilization or even understanding of the purpose of data. So I think it's very important for the government to work collaboratively with the industry uh, to understand all these different nuances and make sure that's added into a, a more blanket policy. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sudev, for the answer. Probably Paheru and Mr. Venkat have something to add about the question as well. Uh, thank you, Bu Vira. I think I agree with Pa Sudev that uh, maybe we, uh, we have to collaborate between the government and private sector. Because you know that the government, they don't have uh, expertise to uh, to develop like apps or to develop the system. I think uh, they know the goal, what what kind of the goal for the, their strategy, their initiative, and also they have money. <laughs> but uh, I think that's an opportunity for the you know, private sector to bid uh, what uh, government want. And uh, I think uh, for the uh, privacy and security, even this is the two things, but uh, I think uh, we have to approach uh, this uh, privacy and security in the, in the one uh, approach, I think. 
but the Indonesia uh, for the security uh, yeah government already aware about the cyber security and we have the uh, right now uh, BSSN that's concerned about the uh, cyber uh, cyber agency and also we have the Ministry of uh, ICT so they concerned about security and they already issued uh, some uh, regulation regarding the security especially at least uh, every company they have to they must have the ISO 2000 uh, and one something like that but uh, we still uh, on the progress and we still uh, uh, facing the problem for the security but the others is about uh, privacy I think uh, I agree with uh, Pak Sudah that uh, Indonesia is part of the uh, global country so we try to uh, adopt also is like a GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, uh, Personal Data Protection Act. Uh, now it's already discussed in the parliament, so we hope uh, in the short time uh, we have uh, uh, personal data protection, so there is no doubt, so everything is clear about uh, which uh, closed data and which one the open data, something like that. Okay, that's all. Bubira. Uh, okay, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, I was just about to add, and I think this is uh, to what uh, uh, Sudev uh, was saying and uh, Fahiru was also saying. I think when it comes to uh, privacy and security in particular, this is kind of where the governments have the most critical role to play because uh, what's happened as we've seen in the last few years, uh, particularly if I look at uh, where I live in the United States is, uh, you know, as people have started to generate and create more data, right, from yes. their own activities and, and, and their, you know, actions, uh, there is, there hasn't necessarily been a well-defined set of, you know, rules or policies governing who owns what. So there is this question of uh, both ownership and agency when it comes to data that is critically important to tackle right at the beginning when you're deciding data policies, right? And I think it's it's uh, it's heartening to see what, you know, from what the Honorable Minister talked about, as well as uh, what Payeru and uh, uh, Sudev were referring to, is that it is a very conscious thing. Uh, certainly, it seems like in Indonesia and in other regions to adopt the right set of policies around who owns uh, data, what, uh, you know, what companies, particularly private companies with, with different incentives are responsible for when it comes to uh, data collection as well as the life cycle and disposition of data and all of the questions of insight and analysis uh, that you that you can derive have to be treated with that as a primary responsibility and uh, it it uh, while and, and i think the collaboration with private companies and governments is necessary to solve many of these sort of uh, pressing problems with data but it has to be done with this foundation of understanding privacy and security and uh, ownership issues around this as a central foundation. It's not, it cannot be an afterthought. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Venkat for your answer. So let's move to this second question. I know that we've already discussed about cybersecurity, but apparently most of our audiences today are really concerned about our security, about the security itself. And they ask how to prevent misuse of data and how the government can ensure that data that security, especially privacy of people. Uh, let's start with I'm sorry, Mira, the last bit was cut off again. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So the question is still for our panelists. And I know we've already talked about uh, cybersecurity, but most of our audiences are concerned about the topic. So they're concerned, uh, especially about how to prevent misuse of data and how mm -hmm. can government ensure data security, especially the privacy of the people? Uh, okay, probably I will start with Paheru. Thank you, Bu Wira. Yeah, I think uh, every party, they have uh, the responsibility. It's like, uh, Maybe government, they have to issue the regulation, which one that part of the privacy with what of the uh, maybe public uh, information. Also like Pa uh, Verkat, uh, Verkat said that uh, about, he asked about uh, 
who own the data. That's very important because when we write the status in the Facebook or Twitter, so who own the data? That's our data or uh, Facebook data. I think uh, uh, the regulation must uh, answer uh, that thing. And the others, uh, maybe uh, it's like uh, now we use a many platform, many uh, applications. So they have the uh, duty also, they have responsibility how to secure the user's data. Last but not least is uh, users. We have to educate the users also, uh, which one the data they can share to the maybe open platform. So which one uh, that's part of the, their privacy, I think. Because sometimes uh, we don't uh, understand, we we'll, we're still confused about uh, the data. Usually that's privacy, but we put it in the social media or something like that. That's it, Bu Wira. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Bapak Heru. Now I will ask. Uh, uh, okay, I will give. Probably, uh, Mr. Venkat and Mr. Sudev have something to add. Uh, thanks, Wira. Uh, I mean, uh, this is an important. Uh, again, I think one you've touched on this. Uh, it can. It's critically important. It's worth talking about again, right? So, policy and. Uh, Policy is certainly one area where government governments will take the lead, and it's already happening. Uh, you know, as Prior mentioned, GDPR is becoming sort of a, a de facto standard for data privacy. Uh, here in the United States, we have even regional specific uh, uh, policies. Like where I live in California, there is a very specific policy set of policies emerging. So that is a critical uh, example of, or it's a responsibility of governments at every level. level to set the right, uh, you know, set of uh, policies around it. I think it will take time to sort of calibrate and arrive at the right balance between, uh, you know, the level of regulation and what, uh, you know, what efficiencies you, you can you can get. Uh, but I think to highlight one of the points that prior you said, I think uh, the it is also, uh, you know, as citizens and individual users and producers of this data, we are increasingly becoming more responsible ourselves in terms of the you know decisions that we have to take with whether we make something uh, you know even whether you're using your phone and whether you decide to give for example location tracking abilities to an, to an app right this is a decision that you can consciously take and over time i think people are developing better understanding of the circumstances in which to allow this to happen who are the kinds of providers that trust uh, and so forth. And then on the side of, uh, you know, when it comes to private companies and industries who have a certain set of incentives, I think over time, the reputation with respect to how they handle customer data privacy issues is going to be a key factor in whether people trust them uh, with their data, right? So I think it's a three-way sort of, uh, you know, participation. One is policy, the other is, you know, the uh, reputation of private companies in, in terms of how they handle this, and then the choices that users make with respect to you know, how they, uh, you know, provide data or make uh, take decisions with respect to the privacy and security of their own data. So, uh, so Dave. Yes, sir. I'll just add and uh, hopefully grow on your point, Venkat. Um, I it's quite similar. There are two things I'll just add. Uh, the first thing is uh, collective awareness. I think that's extremely important. Uh, as you said, the responsibility and also understanding the reputation of organizations and the responsibility on us to also know what we're sharing and what we are, uh, how we are making our data available is very critical. The second part around policies I'll just add is that one of the, uh, the I think a very critical point that uh, should be included in, in a lot of, especially data sharing policies, is it's, the uh, traceability and identification towards a single source of truth. Um, that, that is a very critical point that has to be included in many policies. We see that emerging, obviously, in Europe, there, there, are, there are discussions around there in the EU. Um, so we, we feel that a lot of pub, uh, policies put forward need to include that in order to especially uh, stop the misuse uh, of data, uh, especially maliciously. Uh, so I think uh, three aspects of uh, ethics, uh, governance, and security, those are the three very critical aspects of any given uh, data policy in a country. Okay, thank you so much, Pa Venkat and Mr. Venkat and Mr. Sudev for the answers. 
Now the third question is for Mr. Fengkat. It is from Hari Chandra Sihombing. Uh, how omniscient persuasion or approach will adoptable in Indonesia, where, as we know, our data far from mature? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that we try or we've tried at omniscient, we're not very different from other companies in this, in this respect, where uh, our focus is on uh, enabling, you know, uh, users and certainly uh, interested citizens to get insight from data at every level. So in other words, what that means is we are not uh, a platform designed just for large organizations to be able to take advantage of data, right? So we've always positioned ourselves as a way to, if you have data and you want insight from it, you should be able to use a platform like Omnisite to do that. Now, in, in terms of how mature uh, Indonesia is as a country, and uh, that's uh, you know, I, I would I would argue that in my own uh, observations, again as an external observer uh, who lives in the United States, it feels to me like uh, Asia and Southeast Asia in particular, uh, there is a greater deal of awareness and advancement of, of uh, you know how basically uh, how pervasive uh, technology is in daily lives, even relative to where I live in the United States, right? So. You know, people use uh, digital services a lot more uh, than uh, you know. I would I would even say even here in the United States. So what you know? How can you use Omnisci uh, for this? I think uh, I would encourage you to just uh, you know uh, visit our website and and see what we have at the off at the level of an individual user, where you can start to get insight from the smallest data sets that you have. And then expand that outward to have bigger use cases in, in areas where you want to apply a tool like ours. There are certainly opportunities to do that as well. So my answer is it, it shouldn't, uh, while you know, uh, the, the perspective is that uh, you know, maturity is uh, certainly something to be aware of at the organizational or the governmental level, as an individual user, you can still take advantage of how you can get insight from data with a platform like us. So I would uh, say that that's one place to start. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Venkat, for your answer. Now I'll move on to the fourth, the fourth question is for all panelists. So um, in your opinion, what strategies that private and public sectors need to prepare to attract talents in AI, big data, and cybersecurity fields, considering that there is a huge talent gap in the digital economy? Um, I'll start with Mr. Sudev. Oh, you true. The tough one to me. I was going to start with Venkat on that. <laughs> well, what we've seen, I think, uh, uh, the the unfortunate circumstance is for. I, I I need to phrase this correctly. The unfortunate circumstance is for countries not to compete on salary. I I, I think they 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 fall very quickly into that trap. Uh, thinking that we're going to have to do that. I, I had instances where I've, I've met a couple of uh, startups and this was outside of Indonesia, but it was in Southeast Asia. Uh, and, and they had flown in with a certain form of expertise. You're paid an inflated amount, uh, unfortunately, from a salary point of view. And that basically killed off the industry more so than help enable the industry. I think a lot of this has to come back towards uh, training programs, bridging programs that have to be conducted. A lot of uh, discussions have to be uh, done between government as well as uh, public and private institutions in creating new syllabus or syllabi for uh, universities to encourage the development of this. Uh, we've seen in uh, many countries, if you look at, uh, again, use Singapore, Malaysia as an example, uh, we saw some initiatives out in, um, in uh, the Philippines as well, uh, where uh, data analytics AI falls into a, a subject at this point in time. And they've been updating their curriculum so much uh, together with uh, together with the government, together with private institutions who have partnered in to create this ecosystem to provide the know-how to create the next generation of talent. I, I would say that's the, the, the most logical step at this point in time that governments and, and private entities can work together. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sudhir, for your answer. How about uh, Mr. Fengkat? Do you have any, uh, do you have something to add? Uh, I think uh, so they've covered it well. Uh, a lot of this is, I think, uh, 
if i look at ai and and uh, analytics in particular right in the last few years one of the great things uh, that is different from the previous era of developing skills you know in uh, in technology is how the open source movement uh, has come into play right you know if you look at the key skill sets especially at a technical level uh, you know the kind of platforms that people use for analytics and ai are almost entirely uh, you know done in the open source community and uh, that provides a tremendous advantage because it levels the playing field in terms of access at least to the technology now to what uh, so they were saying that doesn't necessarily mean you naturally develop the skills because this is accessible you still have to very consciously invest at every level right you know it could be everything from a personal level and you know uh, there are a large number of these uh, things like online courses to go pick up basic fundamental skills but then at a governmental uh, uh, or at a policy wide level in terms of how these skills are institutionalized whether it's in curriculums in universities or whether it's in uh, uh, you know how people uh, have formal ways of learning about analytics and ai that is starting to become more and more widespread i think what is reassuring about analytics and ai when it comes to the talent gap is yes it's definitely there uh, i face it you know we face it every day here in, in silicon valley of all places but uh, what is also very encouraging uh, when i look out at uh, you know uh, you know, places like asia in, uh, in particular are how quickly uh, there is a large cohort of people emerging with the right uh, skills in place right so you know while the challenge exists i think the availability of both the uh, the knowledge as well as the conscious effort of governments and others to encourage this uh, you know greater uh, adoption of ai skills is starting to take effect and uh, so i i you know I'm, It, while the talent gap exists i think it's there is a lot that's already happening to address it uh, at an organic level and i think that's that's the good news in, in this okay thank you so much mr venkat how about uh, pa heru what do you think that uh, private and public sectors need to prepare uh, i agree with pa uh, venkat pa sudev that uh, digital talent is part of the uh, ecosystem so i think uh, There must be collaboration between private sector, public sector, government, campus, and in uh, uh, government, I think also community. How to adopt the adopt and learn about uh, new technology? Because you know, uh, the technology is uh, running faster. I think so. I hope maybe the companies like. Uh, Omnisci, you can uh, share your knowledge about your technology to Indonesian people. So maybe uh, we know many things about uh, big data, especially you have the uh, advances about the how we use uh, big data for location-based intelligence, speed, uh, coercity, diagnostic and uh, uh, predictive uh, analysis. I think that's uh, important for many kind aspect of uh, our life uh, in Indonesia, I think. That's all, Bowira. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Pak Heru. Uh, so let's move to the fifth question. This is for our panelists from Puspita Kaban. So is it possible for every department or ministry to develop their own API? Has the data exchange between offices becomes more efficient or even it might be easier for public to access the data? So in your opinion, do you think the government itself has already put enough concern about this issue? And I will start from Paheru. Yeah, I think uh, they can open their uh, API, but uh, sometimes that's uh, yeah, that's a uh, dilemma. You know that if uh, they open uh, the API, maybe sometimes uh, you know many platform, many different tools uh, comes to the. Take any data, especially uh, that uh, secret data, confidential data. I think, but yeah, but uh, uh, that's a good uh, uh, suggestion. I think, but uh, we have to be careful, and we have to make uh, 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 evaluation first. I think before they open the API for the public. I think. Okay. Uh, thank you, Pak Heru. Uh, what about Mr. Sudev? What do you think about the question? 
Can you answer? Could you please answer? Yeah, pretty much. I think Park Heru is spot on. I think a lot of our advisory as well with government is to have to consider um, the scenarios and obviously privacy and security is an, an issue. Um, we, we don't necessarily see that as the best practice, so to speak, as we've seen in some uh, governments. However, I think as Park Heru mentioned, it's very critical to study it first prior to embarking on it and Perhaps Venkat has more of a technology based to expound on. Uh, it's, it, thanks, Dave. I think the, the question of uh, uh, open government, it, you know, I think what, what we've started to see is that uh, across governments, you know, certainly in, uh, in the United States and in, in, in Europe, is something where at, a, at various levels of the government, whether it's uh, local and regional, or whether it's national, there have been increasing and varied levels of efforts to open up access to both the functions of the government, you know, in terms of what you can do online. Uh, so I mean, even the simple things that you can do online, for example, are, you know, go get your license renewed and things of this nature, right? That, that, that's been possible for a while. But off late, there is this, uh, uh, what's more interesting, certainly from a data perspective, is a set of consistent approaches to make data available, right? So whether it's you know summarize statistics about certain functions in the government, or whether it's indeed more granular data about uh, certain things, and uh, it's it's uneven, I would say. Uh, I, and and I uh, I'm apologize because I'm, I'm ignorant of where Asia uh, stands in this. I know there are certain economies that are uh, much further ahead it seems like uh, in in asia relative to others but it's the same even in within the united states where you know you could take a particular state which is more advanced and more sophisticated in terms of how, how they have uh, apis and uh, you know ways to access data as well as services whereas others are a little bit more uh, catching up but i think the trend is towards uh, having these types of open government uh, you know where you can you can provide insight as to how uh, you can certainly start with providing the right services, but also provide insights as well, because uh, an informed citizenry is kind of always going to be better in terms of how they adopt and uh, how policies are uh, successful, right? So uh, I think it's uh, at, a, at a technical level, I think, you know, there's just so many choices in terms of what you can do. Uh, but invariably, I've seen the simpler ones tend to work better. You don't have to be that sophisticated uh, to to get started on this. And I think uh, it, it's, uh, it certainly helps for open, transparent government on, on this front. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Venkat and Mr. Sudev. Uh, let's move to the next question uh, from Meili Dewi. We understand that there are some areas in Indonesia whom do not have access to the internet due to lack of connectivity and expensive prices. What do you think could be done to reach that information? Probably I'll start with uh, Mr. Sude Mr. Sudev. Sorry, could you repeat the last part of your question? Just the okay. last Okay, what do you think that could be done to bridge that information gap? Oh, the information gap, um, access. <laughs> Connectivity, I think that's uh, that's uh, that would be the simple answer. Uh, I had I had the extreme pleasure of being on a on a, a forum with the UN to talk about um, uh, education and and the betterment of access of education um, in Southeast Asia specifically, and uh, uh, as well as um, countries who are who are emerging. Um, the the basic thing after. To our conversation, it just came down to the very basic thing of access. You, you, you have, uh, you have uh, countries at this point in time who have dubbed uh, access or connectivity uh, as, as a utility. You need it. It's, it's a must. It, it should come to a point where it is affordable to everyone and that access is given to everyone. Uh, we have use cases from uh, countries where there's uh, PPPs going on, where uh, uh, whether fiber is rolled out or whether 5G uh, base stations are built so, or towers are built simply between the government as well, collaborating with um, telecommunications uh, companies. So I think those are the, the very relevant best, uh, best practices we've seen. And, um, and I think the, 
the discussion point around that um, is that ultimately for a lot of uh, telecoms organizations, and I hope I don't take anyone off, but uh, ultimately it is telecoms organizations are profit making. And if you're asking them to put a, a very huge amount of money into investing into infrastructure, there, there needs to be some skin in the game from the government as well coming in. Um, and we think that uh, that collective PPP is, has just been the, the, the sweet spot when, when we've seen proliferation of uh, connectivity um, across uh, many countries. In Southeast Asia, I think Malaysia is a very good example of that PPP. The extension of the access is, is um, I would say the, the coverage is very good. Uh, the Philippines uh, as well right now with DICT, uh, the rollout they're doing is to, uh, to, to get very closely on uh, PPP together with, uh, with, with the large telecoms companies, um, especially during this uh, time of a pandemic where they're trying to create a better normal for Filipinos to work at home. And they understand that connectivity is a, is a huge challenge uh, across the Philippines. And therefore, they are looking at it as a very strategic trust area to roll out infrastructure in partnership with the telcos over the next uh, 12 months. So you can see that as a common best practice. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Sudha. Probably Pak Heru and Mr. Venkat have something to add. Thank you, Wira. Yeah, I think uh, about the uh, uh, many villages in Indonesia, uh, 12,500. 100 uh, villages they don't have uh, access to the internet. I think we have to understand that uh, access to the internet right now is part of the uh, human right. So government have, uh, they have a homework to provide the, the access to uh, the villages. So even right now, uh, uh, the minister already mentioned that uh, they will finish this thing in 2022. So maybe we have to push them that uh, they have to accelerate uh, to provide access to 12.5 uh, thousand, maybe in 2000, uh, 20, 2021 or uh, next year. Uh, besides that, I think uh, TV, we can use uh, to provide uh, information gap. So maybe uh, there's uh, two things that uh, we can do uh, to provide information to a law for Indonesia. So maybe we can understand that Indonesia is very large, very wide. So a little bit difficult lah, to provide the uh, internet access with high speed, especially in uh, all over Indonesia. Thank you, Bubira. Okay, what about uh, Mr. Feng? Oh, okay, thank you, Pal Heru. What about Mr. Fengkat? Uh, I mean, I think uh, both uh, uh, Sudev and, and Pal Heru covered it well. I think uh, access is now a fundamental I think we can all agree that it's a fundamental right in, in many ways, right? And it, it's going to require, uh, I think, uh, Sudev brought up an important point about how for the, the fundamental industry, which is the ICT industry that is involved in making the investments to provide this access, they have to have the right incentives to do so, which I think governments uh, across uh, the world are starting to uh, you know, work with, and I think the the partnerships there are fundamental to that. Uh, but yes, it does actually boil down to uh, even for a company like ours, you know, which uh, exists at the other side of, uh, you know, providing this access and connectivity. Uh, when you have to actually look at the data and derive insights from it, the fundamental problem to solve is around, uh, and particularly, I think uh, you know, all all forms of access. Uh, possible and to uh, and in particular focusing on the least the lesser served areas of society right it's easier to solve these problems in for example uh, concentrations of you know urban areas where it is almost a part of the infrastructure versus consciously solving for them in rural and uh, lesser served areas right i think that's kind of uh, while the uh, approaches uh, you know while companies and, and uh, governments certainly need to uh, uh, the partnership is critical as, as both Paheru and so they were pointing out. I think the focus on the right set of areas which are underserved in particular, I think will, will help, which is uh, uh, I think uh, a key part of this. But yeah, access is fundamentally the, the problem to solve here. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Venkat for your answer. Actually, we still have a lot of questions, but unfortunately our time is limited. So thank you very much for all speakers and participants for the delightful uh, discussions today.
So stay tuned to our website, www.thejakartapost.com to get the latest updates about Indonesia and the world. Don't forget to follow our social media pages on Facebook, The Jakarta Post, on Twitter, at JakPost, and on Instagram, at JakPost Images. Before I officially end the webinar, I would like to invite all the speakers to take photo. Okay, so I will count to three and then we are ready to go. Okay, one, two, and three. Okay, thank you so much. Once again, thank you very much. Have a great day, stay healthy, okay. and see thank you, you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pak Sudev, Pak Pengkat. Thank you, see you. Bye,